My name is Inyolo Aboeji. Um, I am, uh, I like to call myself an entrepreneur in the public interest. So what I do is basically I, I start companies that are um, highly impactful and typically in the tech industry. Um, and I grow them really fast and then I go build another one. Um, today, um, I, um, I basically run a platform for um, creating this type of businesses um, called Street or Capital. Um, and I'm also co-founder um, of, uh, of a platform that's um, focused on uh, um, trying to help the general public, um, entrepreneurs and large corporations in Africa, specifically in Nigeria, um, understand what's coming in the future and how they need to position themselves to react to it. And that platform is called Future of Africa. I, I literally fell into tech tech by accident. Um, I had, you know, been uh, very much in the publishing world. I actually ran a physical student newspaper <laughs> for a year. And then um, I met up with an old friend from uh, the first year of school. And um, he had just gone to Silicon Valley um, and come back. And this was sometime about 2008, 2009, when Facebook blew up. Um, and, um, and so he introduced me to the general idea of tech. Um, we ended up starting booknetto.com together, um, which was my first foray into tech. And then, um, you know, the story goes on from there. Um, I think for me, what I've really come to understand about technology in particular, um, and about the special role it plays in development of, an, of a society is that it really does allow, um, at scale, uh, miracles. <laughs> um, you, know, f you know, if you think about in this country, I remember, the first time uh, my parents brought home a phone, a mobile phone, uh, in 1999, 2000, um, when we became a democracy. Um, you know, they bought the phone SIM for 23,000 Naira, um, and they had bought the phone for roughly about 67,000 Naira. And then I think about, you know, with 13,000 Naira, you can get a really, really nice phone that's probably, I think they bought it at 310. So just 20 years later, for half the price of the SIM card, you can actually get a whole phone. You start to understand how technology is, um, is such an incredible multiplier and what it means for society. Uh, that's an important question that I'm only just starting to answer. So if I told you I knew what the answer is, I would, I would be telling you an absolute lie. Um, I think what I try to do is just to be sensitive to the needs of my family. Um, and also do work that allows me to spend, um, expend short bursts of energy where I can focus and get work done and build a fantastic team that can carry on the work while I go and spend time with my family. So just, you know, trying, trying to be intense, focus on one thing at a time is kind of how I'm managing that challenge right now. I think for me, it's um, inspiring a lot of people to get into tech. I mean, I remember in 2014 when we started Andela. Um, I remember having interviews with young people um, who we were trying to recruit and to learn how to build technology. And at the time, it seemed like something no one wanted to touch. Um, we had, I think we managed to shortlist like 70 people for interviews and only like uh, 30 people showed up. Um, and, and once in a while I run into the folks that didn't come to the interview. Uh, it's funny, one of them actually works as a works as my chief of staff now, so <laughs> I'm very forgiven. But I, I, I mean, at the end of the day, I just think about the reaction then and the reaction now because, you know, she went on to start um, many amazing companies because she then got interested in tech. So I think, um, you know, I think that's my greatest achievement for me. It's just inspiring a lot of young people to get into tech because it's just, a, you know, and, and literally changing their lives um, by doing so and changing society by doing so. I mean, I mean, uh, you know, that's always a question that's interesting to answer after the fact. <laughs> because, if, um, but I, I'll say, um, certainly, there are a few things I would have done differently. Um, I think one of those things was definitely um, being more intentional about leveraging the platform um, to expand access um, to people. Um, and also leveraging the platform to also educate people about why tech is important, 
and what it is. I think um, there was definitely a tendency um, in many times in my career for me to focus a lot on making the companies grow really quickly and making profits, which is great, um, especially because even by doing so, you do make some impact. But I think that uh, building a platform that could um, replicate um, that, uh, like I'm doing now with Street Capital and Future.Africa, but I wish it was something I did a lot earlier. I think we're, we're getting to a point of influence and I think where we need to go next is mainstreaming. So how do you help um, a young boy living in Makoko to understand and appreciate um, a future with technology? Um, because today he doesn't really understand it. Um, uh, how do you help an old grandma um, in Ishei or your state to understand um, and appreciate the importance of technology because today she doesn't quite have that same kind of experience. Um, so I think that that's really where we need to go because if tech doesn't win the hearts of the people, it will never scale. Um, and I look at the examples of my colleagues in the US and what they face, um, the constant persecution and misunderstanding uh, about their impact and scale of their reach. And I think for me, that's one of the greatest fears is that a society that needs technology so much grows to hate it because it becomes a tool of oppression rather than a, um, a tool that delivers the kind of freedom and democracy that they desperately want to see. There are many, 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 many challenges. Um, uh, I think, um, I mean, the biggest one is obviously uh, a clueless government. <laughs> Um, you know, just um, the amount of sheer waste in ideas and effort over the last four years when it comes to the tech industry, trying to engage the government and uh, the element of personal interest just making things far more difficult and they need to be, um, it's definitely been kind of like uh, heavy on my mind. Um, it's the biggest challenge we face, the fact that you know, because of the influence that tech has, there's always people willing to use it as a tool for enriching themselves rather than uh, building a future in the public interest. Um, and I think it's something that, you know, it's a challenge we have to fight. Um, it's a challenge, you know, that we have to um, build defenses against. Um, and, you know, for us, you know, the biggest way to do that is by educating the populace um, so they understand what uh, well-implemented tech policy looks like. and and what poorly implemented tech policy look like, looks like. Um, um, so yeah, I think that's one of the bigger challenges. So the challenge really with Nigerian tech is, is that it's not really a question of policy. It's, it's, I think it's more a question of attitude, right? Um, because policy is easy to formulate. And we have a lot of fantastic policy. You look at NOTAP, you look at NITA, you look at all these enabling acts and it's fantastic. It's all fantastic words on paper. But in terms of an attitude to tech that allows talented young people to be able to leverage technology to solve problems, that's what we're not seeing. Um, and an attitude to um, essentially governing the technology industry in the public interest, uh, making sure certain critical infrastructure exists and is shared appropriately and people have access um, and creators have access and um, you know we're breeding the right kind of talent. Those things don't exist. Um, and I think I think that's gonna be the biggest shift um, is you know a government and leadership in the technology aspects of government that actually truly believes in the transformational power of technology. Um, without that, it doesn't matter how fantastic the policy is. You have a few smart people sit around for a few days and dream up fantastic stuff on paper, but not, none of it is gonna mean anything to the average Nigerian. I'll give you an example, right? Uh, first bill, uh, the vice president signed executive order, he signed into law when he came in, was executive order one, which basically mandated that every um, arm of government must reply um, every inquiry from citizens within 48 hours or consider that a, an approval. Um, obviously in practice it hasn't taken place. I mean, 
um, there's all these several, I mean, if you were thinking about that as a tech person, you're definitely thinking about an API for government, a server-oriented architecture that would allow requests to move from one government department to the other electronically, right? Uh, and put things in queue. Well, it hasn't happened yet. <laughs> you get what I'm saying? So that, that just gives you a sense of an attitude to government, right? That, uh, you know, um, there's still, you know, we have NIMC. Um, NIMC still had over 60% of its data gleaned from BVN, which was a private sector effort led by the, by the, by the Nigerian banks, right? Um, right now, you know, NIMC is pretty much still waiting for funding, as they say, to, to commence, uh, you know, active operations in actually digitizing the records of our people, right? Um, we look at the last election, right? I, I mean, we have got into a point where it's very clear that if we ever want to have free and fair elections in this country, they have to be electronic. And, uh, you know, the politicians are denying the reality, even though several bills have been put in front of the president, passed by the legislature, because we like to say the legislature is a problem, but it's not true. And, and the president has refused to sign them. Um, so, so we really do have to ask hard questions of our leadership, about whether they believe in a tech um, ecosystem or they believe in, in a digital democracy or they believe in, um, in tech, in transformative power of technology. And if they don't, you know, then we have to find other ways to make it happen. And that would not include the government. I think he doesn't understand it and so it's easy for politicians to tell him what, they, what he wants to hear. <laughs> um, if he did understand it, it would be harder. He would ask the right questions. But he doesn't understand it and he doesn't want to. Right now, I'm kind of uh, beyond my family, which is now a major focus for me. Um, two, two major projects for me. Um, first of all, we have Street Capital. Um, we've amassed a lot of experience understanding how to do what we call markets-led investing, which is this general idea that rather than investing in ideas, you see clear gaps in the market that need um, experienced um, talent and, and operation, operators to fulfill, and then we come fill that gap. Um, and that, you know, that's going very well. Uh, we need a couple of investments, they're doing very well. Um, so that's kind of my capital side. Um, and then we have um, our other business called Future.Africa, which is a, uh, a community um, that we're building um, in conversation about the future. And the community is com comprised of entrepreneurs who are trying to build the future in Africa, comprised of corporates who want to digitally transform. Um, and are thinking, you know, how can I evolve my company to survive the next 50 years? Um, and, then, um, and then the public who really want to understand how um, the future is being built in their best interest. And so what we try to do is to convene conversations, um, both online and offline, um, that, um, that bring these issues to the fore and get people to have an active conversation about the future. You know, the honest truth is I don't know. I'll be honest, um, but I do understand from the public communication um, that um, that um, the, the big shift now is how do you move uh, how do you move um, a lot of the work and data that we've collected over the years um, online? Um, how do you move that digital? Because we've we've kind of we've been a technology driven business, but fairly traditional in our approach, and now we're moving to a model where we want to share our technology and tools with the rest of the world. Um, so a big part of that is like, you know, helping build that product, helping create a, a, a market for that product, right? Helping implement that product. So I, I'm excited to see what they do. I, you know, I, I have no clue. <laughs> but I, you know, Jeremy Johnson and his team always find a use for that money that, that prints more. So I have no doubt in my mind <laughs> that it's going to be used well. Not like, kind of almost like open sourcing, you yeah, Maybe not open sourcing is the word, but it's kind of like, think about it as, okay, uh, replicating at scale, mm. right? So how do you create like 100,000 Mandela's essentially, anywhere it's needed? So I'd love to see how they do that. So when I think about um, the way our tech ecosystem has evolved, um, We've kind of started out with talent and that went really well. Um, now we have kind of all the, what I call connecting tissue businesses, so payments, logistics, still in the software realm, but fairly important. 
what I'm increasingly excited about, I think, is what data and a focus on data assets can help us do in the real world. Um, you know, um, for a long time, I've always imagined that um, there's an opportunity to do data-driven investing. Um, and there's an opportunity to build on top of real world assets, data layers that help um, companies outperform, companies that are digital first, outperform those who aren't. And um, I think what's going to happen in that world is you have um, more and more companies looking at offline assets, right? Um, so you, you start to see a, a swallowing of uh, of existing uh, businesses, really, or digitizing, depending on how you look at it. And there was one, there was one, yeah, yeah, as, as a path to transformation. Um, so I, I saw an, an interesting piece of news, um, a company called M Pharma, which I'm very, I know very well, acquired the second largest pharmacy chain in Nairobi. Um, and I look at that and I said, I, I'm definitely, I definitely think more deals like that are gonna happen. <laughs> and in Nigeria, maybe even bigger deals. Um, a lot of the corporates who are underperforming um, because they haven't been able to successfully digitally transform um, will likely uh, make huge moves. And some companies who see the future will wholesale transform from day one and say, look, um, we're cutting off this. I'm starting to see it a lot. You know, I have a bank client who's making a decision to cut their legacy banking products, literally, and move digital first except for corporate clients, uh, which, which is huge, a big decision for a bank. Uh, <laughs> um, so what happens when the only bank, banks that exist are digital banks, right? Um, and whoever is the first mover in that, in that realm is, is, is it, yeah. So there's a lot coming down the pipeline. I, I want to see what happens when the, the, the operators run the shop as opposed to the the P guess. <laughs>